When I'm not attending my first breathwork class, aka paying $50 to breathe outdoors in Southern California, I like to answer questions and comments that I get on my YouTube channel, so let's get to it. I feel the guitar has so many secrets to uncover. I appreciate you exposing these secrets and all the hard work you do for us. You are truly the uncoverer of guitar secrets. Thanks so much for putting in the time to do this. Love this comment. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't consider a lot of these secrets, but I do want to maybe do a quick video on some stuff that I just had no idea was actually a thing when I was teaching myself to play guitar. And these are just some things that maybe misconceptions I had or stuff that I didn't realize or anticipate I would use so often in my, you know, 20 years of playing guitar. Starting out as just kind of like bedroom noodler, then kind of getting in recording, and then, you know, touring professionally as like an acoustic duo accompaniment thing for, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of shows. And then just making YouTube videos and kind of like getting feedback from people, right? So here's just a few things that I didn't know. Number one, I did not know how little I would use the high E string, okay? Now, a lot of these are going to be really kind of dependent on your style. This is just my style. Maybe this is bad advice. This isn't even advice. These are just things that I learned, okay? So when I say I don't use the high E string, let's do an example. Like, let's say a D major 7 chord like this. Okay, maybe it's like I'd look up a tab or a chord chart how to play a D major seven chord voicing like not like an open one but like this or any major seven chord voicing where it's like all right I've got I've got a bar the fifth fret starting on the A string then ring finger seventh fret on the D string middle finger sixth fret on the G string pinky seventh fret on the B string make sure to come straight down with that pinky to get tone or even just like a regular D major chord where it's five seven 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 five to really kind of like pro i spent so much time trying to get this shape where i could hear the high e string ring out to kind of get that nice a on top doesn't matter nobody cares it doesn't matter at all right once you start playing three four hour sets restaurant gigs whatever it's really just all about how does it, how do I make this sound right? How do I make the sound like a song? And in the grand scheme of things, playing a D major seven using the middle four strings instead of all five strings is so negligible, nobody will ever care. It's so much easier on your hands. It helps you be able to play longer. Your hand doesn't get fatigued as often when you don't bar chord all of your chords. Again, not that professional guitar players don't ever use bar chords. I've made jokes like that in the past and it's like, come on, you know I'm kind of kidding. But I'm really not kidding when it comes to my own playing because anytime you can play a chord, you can always play it just using the middle four strings, okay? So, for example, let me just go through all the chords, as seventh chords even. That's maybe like a side note, how when you're just playing acoustic guitar and accompanying, turning anything into a seventh chord can kind of make it a little more interesting, in my opinion. Let's go through all the seventh chords in the key of A major, right? Let's do them um, regular how you'd see in a Mel Bay book. We've got the one chord, A major, two chord, B minor, look at that full B minor, three chord, C sharp minor, four chord, D major, E major, F sharp, minor, oh, everybody hates that chord, G sharp, half diminished, A. Or I can just use the middle four strings. I'm not even gonna hit the low or the high E string, A, major seven, B, minor seven, C sharp, minor seven, D, major seven, E, seven. That's like kind of like the closest thing we have to really a bar chord here. Even like the set, the minor seven chords, half diminished. Even like, you know, if you sit, look at that B minor seven here, you'd be like, oh, is this really two, four, two, three? So it's like, well, that's still a bar chord. Guess what? You can play it like this. Is it a B minor seven or a B minor? It doesn't really matter. Can't even hear that G string. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. I rarely will use full bar chords. Most of the time, I'm actually just getting the middle four strings, and then what I'm doing here is my middle finger is kind of muting the top, and my pointer finger is nudging against the bottom low E string. So I'm not getting any kind of like rogue notes because everything is self-contained in this shape in the midst of the strings, right? So if you're having trouble with bar chords, don't worry about it. Kind of keep pressing through. Eventually it'll come if that is a goal of yours, but it's something that I never 
really it's like the the more i played guitar the less i started using them and the more i started coming up with alternative ways to play this so i've got a couple other ones i want to share with you but first i want to tell you about the sponsor of this video it is distrokid distrokid is how i get i'm all my music up online basically you pay one super low price and then you get unlimited uploads there's a couple different tiers that you can get depending on how many bands you want to do this for but if it's just you yourself, kind of like releasing your music, unlimited uploads, I'll put it up on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, a bunch of other music streaming services I've never even heard of, but they're all pretty legit. And then it stores all your, your money. You can kind of like even use it with like just music on TikTok and stuff and put it on Instagram reels. It's a really cool way, even if you you don't have ambitions to become like a, like a major artist or anything, it's fun just to have stuff that you made up online that you can share and put over, you know, different social media things. So... Check out DistroKid, you get a percentage off if you use my affiliate link in the description. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about them later too because of another question coming up. But back to some more tips of stuff that I was surprised I didn't know more when I was starting out, right? Uh, the next one is gonna be, I don't use scales nearly as much as I thought I would. And this is something that I spent a long time practicing. I was like, all right, everybody says I gotta learn my scales. Maybe it starts with pentatonic, right? Got that, got that under my fingers. Maybe then it's like, all right, now I gotta do the major scale, G major, right? And then I gotta do all the modes of it, Dorian. And you know, I learned all that stuff and it was very helpful. And I think it was very, you know, it, it made me a better musician to learn the scales. But in practice, it's funny how I don't really think of the scales so much as I think of the chords. And that's why arpeggios are so important. So a real quick example, I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna make a chord progression that doesn't make sense. It's gonna go out of the key, right? So it's gonna start with the people's chord. G major, B flat major. All right, now we're already out of a key. So if you just memorized a, a fretboard roadmap, just all through the positions of G, you're already, you're already kind of screwed, right? G major, B flat major. We could just vamp here and it's like, does this sound so wrong? A song, right? There's a lot of stuff that you can put over that. Let's make it even spicier. Let's go to A minor 7, then C minor 7, okay? So it's like, well, what do I play over this? Because now it's like all the stuff that I've worked on as far as these connecting shapes is kind of gone. Well, if you think of each chord individually and stuff you could do, then there's a lot of stuff you could do. So maybe I'll do like the first half of each chord. I'll play the chord in a rhythmic kind of way. And then I'll jump into something thinking of an arpeggio or just using notes from that actual chord, chord tones instead of a full fleshed out chord. So I can start with a G, G, B flat, same G, B flat, A, C, G, None of that was thinking of like, all right, the totality of one scale. I almost think it's like, it take it takes a lot to really be able to like switch scale roadmaps in time like that in a way that kind of makes sense, which is maybe how I thought it worked when I was first learning. I think what's better is like, all right, I've got this G chord, and then I know that an arpeggio that goes with that, or just kind of like playing the chord tones. Something like that, right? Instead of just a G major chord, and instead of thinking of the full scale, right, I'm just gonna go G, A, B, D, G, A, B, D, G. And then I can just kind of play anything from there. And then I can just start kind of vamping in there. And now I'm practicing and playing musically, in my opinion, <laughs> some people might disagree with that, uh, something over that chord. And then as soon as I switch to B flat, a chord that is not in this key, with that shape, this new chord position, all those same things apply because it's a major chord. So it's like G and then some major stuff, then B flat, then some of its major stuff, then a minor seven, and guess what? I can still think of minor pentatonic, which is a scale, or you can think of it as, you know, a smaller arpeggio scale, because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, an arpeggio is technically the notes that are in the chords you're using, but once you're using like minor seven chords, you're four fifths of the way there with the minor pentatonic scale anyways. 
So you're like 80% of the scale there. So it's like, what's really the difference between pentatonic scales and Again, these questions don't really mean anything in the long term. It's just being able to be like, all right, there's the chord. What do I want to do over there? Chord tones, pentatonic scale, and then that moves everything that I know moves with it, right? So that's kind of like another thing that, you know, I just, I just, if I would have known that earlier, it's not that it's a bad thing to learn scales and to practice them again, super musically valid, very helpful for everything. But it's funny how I don't really think that way unless I'm trying to explain something. When I'm actually playing something in context, I always think of chord tones first. All right, yeah, that's just me. Another thing is I, I didn't start palm muting until I was probably several years. I didn't even know what palm muting was. Everything I played was like G. Maybe I played Wonderwall, right? And it's like everything always sounded like that probably for the first several years I played guitar if I wasn't doing single note lead things. And then it's like, oh, once I started actually performing more, it's like, oh wow, guess what? You can bring it down and you can, you can make Wonderwall sound like your own, right? <laughs> because it all comes down to Wonderwall in the end, doesn't it? So really just kind of taking your palm, chopping. I got videos on palm muting. I'm not gonna go through everything, but I, I really think that I use some form of palm muting in basically every single thing that I ever, ever play, right? In, in, no, in no scenario am I ever just full on not controlling some kind of either tone or volume with the actual right hand, my right hand, my strumming hand, whether it's just kind of muting the strings just to get that dampened effect or to do it for like a tonal choice, right? So again, these are three things that I use really pretty much every single time I ever pick up a guitar that I was never taught. These are just things that I just kind of like organically happened upon. And, uh, you know, maybe sharing them with you could make you get a jump start on it. Or if not, you just call me an idiot. That's fine too. Dude, I started listening to you on Spotify and your music is so unique. As a guitar player, I never really heard a song that was like that. Holy smokes, I wanna sound like that guy. And I was wondering if you thought about a video on your process for bringing a song together. Sorry for the lack of punctuation. And also, Hairpins is a masterpiece and I love it. I forgot to say thanks. Oh my gosh, easiest way to get your question on the QA is just to compliment my original music. It's funny, I actually do have some music out there. Hairpins too, I, I guess I'll put Hairpins in the description. That's, uh, oh my gosh, that's a song that is too real to me. I wrote that about my ex-girlfriend and it was like one of those things of like introspection that like I, I wasn't even planning on releasing it. I did eventually release it through DistroKid because why not? And uh, you know, people, people seem to like that one. I definitely think it's, the most personal, vulnerable song I've ever put out there online, because uh, I remember like writing that song. It just like it wrecked me to write that song. So I don't know. I think I think it's pretty cool. Uh, every time I'm doing live streams, which hopefully I'll do another one coming up soon. If I can get my internet thing figured out here, it's just that's why I haven't been doing as many live streams from this spot. It's because the internet always drops out, and I, it's embarrassing when it happens. But yeah. Hairpins is a staple in my personal live set, but uh, let me know if you guys want to see more like songwriting stuff because I'm always kind of like, do people really care about this? I don't know. I kind of have the bread and butter of what I do, but I'm super, I'm super open to that kind of thing because I do want to start releasing more original music and maybe even promoting it, God forbid. But uh, yeah, it's so easy to do with DistroKid, who's also a sponsor, so it makes more sense for me to be uploading music. Anyways, thank you for the compliment. Check out the song if you're fancy. As someone who's been playing sessions for about 30 years, I have to say this is the sort of thing that makes me leave the session. Hashtag Dunning-Kruger effect. <laughs> so as the pre-qualifier, which you said that you've been playing sessions for 30 years, and this is the kind of thing that makes you leave a session. So the kind of thing that makes you walk out of a paid gig is watching a beginner video on how to play Irish music, and then feeling that you already know so much that I'm a victim of the Dunning-Kruger effect has caused you to just leave your session. You're actually an idiot. It's, it's funny, it's actually, this comment is more of a, a validation for the Dunning-Kruger effect than even intended, but you know, salty blues comment, whatever. How about back-to-back -back salty comments? Here's another good one. To be fair, I can't name any of your songs, and you say you're a self-proclaimed professional musician. The only difference is I'd actually listen to Usher. <laughs> so I had a joke 
pre-Super Bowl about how there being more notes in the pentatonic scale than Usher songs people can name. And again, it was just a joke, but I, I, I had no idea for the amount of Usher fans that really came for me on that. So again, I'm, I'm very sorry to the Usher people out there, you know, who were offended. I do, li I do like this comment because it's so like redundant. Uh, to be fair, I can't name any of your songs, and you say you're a self-proclaimed professional musician. It's like, well, yeah, as if I say it, then it's self-proclaimed. You don't have to say, you say you're a self-proclaimed musician. And the best part is, it's like, again, I'm not trying to be the grammar police for salty troll commenters, but you can also see that this comment was edited. So they took the time. Like, if you're just kind of firing off just troll comments willy-nilly, that's fine, you know? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna always engage with that kind of behavior, but it, it's, it's, I, I, un, I understand that maybe this person is just deeply troubled and they're just, ah, just spewing anger and hate all over the internet. But to like, say something, have it be dumb, and then go back and edit it, and it's still dumb, I think you've really, you've really dropped the ball. Fumbled the bag on that one, my friend. I like train wrecks, so I was served well. Now this isn't salty because this was supposed to be a train wreck. This was me and Claire doing Valerie, but I'm playing and accompanying her on both guitar and kazoo at the same time. <laughs> so I'm just being taken away by how good it is. Valerie! And for whatever reason, I'm so much more proud of my kazoo work. <laughs> than I am of singing or writing songs or anything. Just because I feel like it's so, it's so, I mean, I don't know. This, let's just, let's just pat myself on the back here. The maximum skill required to hold a kazoo in your mouth, play guitar and kazoo at the same time, is probably my most impressive skill set. So even though it is a train wreck, I'm still gonna post those every now and then. So let me know what kind of kazoo covers you'd like to see coming up. All right, so for listening homework, it's, it's just gonna be my song here, friends. Why not? Let's just go, just go full, full self-promotion here because that's what we're doing here this year. Thank you again to DistroKid for sponsoring the video. Definitely, if you are considering putting music online, please use my affiliate link. It really helps me a lot. Those guys are super awesome. Really close to those guys. They do great work, great people. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, send me to the comment section, Instagram, or the website. I'll talk to you all soon.